Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ruby Ann Levendorf, and it is a great honor and privilege to welcome you all to the third Academy of Science of South Africa, SF. I hope I'm pronouncing the acronym correctly. Presidential Roundtable, where science, scholarship, and society comes together to deliberate on contemporary issues. I would specifically like to acknowledge the president and chairperson of um, SF, the Council of SF, Professor Jonathan Janssen, who has generously agreed to host this event um, with the Department of Science and Technology, with our institution, Nelson Mandela University, and also hosted par partly by the um, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Engagement, Professor Leach. Um, he's unfortunately not here, he's not well. Um, the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy, um, the director is here, Alan Zinn. Um, the Center for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation, um, Andre Keat. Yes, he's here. <laughs> I know I saw you earlier on. And then also our local newspaper, Herald. I'm not sure who the representative of Herald is. Right, you're most welcome. I also wish to acknowledge our four expert um, panelists who will be sharing the insights and I think Prof will be um, introducing them shortly. So maybe just a bit of background as far as SF is concer um, concerned. So the Academy for Science um, of um, South Africa or of Science of South Africa was inaugurated in um, 1996 by our namesake um, uh, Nelson Mandela and he was a patron of the Academy from then until his death. So prior to his, its establishment, there was really um, almost like a race for who's the best um, academy in terms of science between um, the Royal Society of um, South Africa and the Academy of Science. And they both basically aspired for this best position. So the objective of this academy um, is to promote and apply scientific thinking um, in service of society. And how appropriate is it for us to be here tonight to discuss um, the topic of to get high or not to get high? That is the question, okay? Um, the panel will be um, sharing an evidence-based dialogue um, on the legalization of cannabis um, use in um, private capacity. So, in terms of cannabis, um, in 2017, Lesotho was the first um, country in Africa um, to provide um, license for cannabis cultivation. But the cu cultivation was purely for medicinal purposes as well as um, scientific um, purposes. Then this year in April, Zimbabwe also stepped into that um, arena and um, provided licenses for cultivation for um, scientific purposes as well as medicinal um, use. And then comes the Constitutional Court ruling in um, uh, September of this year, where there was a ruling that individuals may cultivate privately um, cannabis for personal use, okay? Which is very different to what had happened in Lesotho as well as um, Zimbabwe. And I guess that is what the concern is is that even though they, um, they are pros to making cannabis available, the fact that um, it is now being made available for per, um, personal use, um, is it for recreational use? Is it for medicinal purposes? And it's not um, stipulated. And so our panelists will be sharing their um, expertise around um, the use of cannabis um, from a medicinal pers perspective as well as social perspective. What was interesting though, when um, a um, analysis was done on cannabis related research using a tool called Scopus, how many articles or documents do you think was drawn up since um, 1936 to 1917? Over 40,000 documents, scientific documents were identified. And the majority was published in US followed by Canada, UK, um, Australia, and um, Germany. 
So it is very interesting that the, there's been an exponential growth in the amount of scientific endeavor or research linked to cannabis. So with no further ado, Prof, most welcome, and we are looking forward to this roundtable discussion. So let me uh, thank Dr. Ruby Ann uh, Levendahl for uh, that wonderful introduction. And let me also, just before we get going, thank our colleagues at the uh, Nelson Mandela University for this beautiful venue, but also uh, for the wonderful arrangements that have been made. Um, uh, first of all, my colleague, of course, uh, the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Sibongile uh, Mutua. We're very grateful to her and her team, uh, DVC Professor Leach, you've already heard. And then my former colleague from the University of the Free State, Professor Andre Kiet, who has a very, uh, for a change, a very powerful team uh, working uh, 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 with him, uh, Marissa Buerta, and uh, is a Deronik. Okay. I don't know where some of these beautiful names come from. Uh, Deronik, I, 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 my, 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 one of my family members, uh, twice removed, uh, d just introduced me to a daughter. I couldn't believe this. This is when you know you're back in the hood uh, and the Cape Flats, uh, whose name is, I lie you not, cliche. <laughs> cliche, yeah. So I asked her, it's a small kid, five years old. So I said, do you know what cliche means? She says, yes, uncle. It's what goes around comes around. I said, no, God. <laughs> you know. Anyway, so thank you to them. Thank you to the amazing pianist, uh, uh, Ashton Cousins. I'm sorry, I'm a jazz pianist, you know, in my off time. Give him another round, please. That was, that was, uh, uh, that was uh, amazing. And then, of course, my, my old friend from Port Elizabeth. Uh, I, I only come here for her, uh, Malta Bella and Steady Milk. The, you know, this is the only place in the country we can get Steady Milk, you know. <laughs> Uh, the fat content is ridiculously high, but it is really good. So, Michelle, thank you very much for bringing people from the business community here, uh, people from all your contacts, your clients, and so on. Uh, welcome to all of you. So, the Academy of Science of South Africa is, uh, uh, you know, the only recognized academy in South Africa, certainly from the point of view uh, of the government, and it does amazing work in uh, science. And our understanding of science is, of course, uh, uh, very broad. It includes not only the natural sciences, but also the social sciences, humanities, education, and the like. Um, and, um, and we go around the country trying to talk about science in a way that uh, grabs the attention of, of our people. So one of the things that I inaugurated since becoming president last year was something called presidential roundtables. And the first one was held at the University of Stellenbosch on institutional rankings, you know, this habit of ranking universities uh, in the world, but also in Africa and in South Africa. Personally, I think it's a waste of money, but um, it is uh, something that universities do increasingly around the world, because if you don't, you're out of the game and people make choices that could disadvantage your institution. So we had the best science available, the best research available on institutional rankings, and that was a very successful seminar. Then we did one at, uh, uh, in Johannesburg, at the Johannesburg Country Club, and there we talked about uh, civility uh, uh, on campuses in the wake of the 2014-2015 student protests. What has happened to civility? And I must tell you, I don't think this is a campus problem. Uh, if you look at what's happening in our parliament, uh, if you look at just the way in which we speak to each other, you know, I mean, you've got to, be concerned about the degrading of the public discourse. And, and that is a great worry, you know, uh, for the future of our democracy. But when campuses, places where we in fact prepare the next generation of leaders become part of this uh, incredibly uh, toxic discourse, then of course we have to ask what is the best uh, scholarship on these issues? What can we learn from other countries? What do we know that allows us to intervene and change those, um, uh, those outcomes. So the third presidential roundtable, we're very happy to host with Nelson Mandela University. And we have a stellar panel here today, uh, some amazing people, 
uh, I had to remind them since this is what many of them do for a living, which is to think hard about the chemistry and, uh, behind this, as well as the issue, the social issues like addiction and so on and so forth. And I reminded them that this is a fairly mixed audience of people, uh, including uh, parents of children who are addicted or were addicted, uh, the media, of course. Uh, un uh, I'm glad the media is here. Unlike the Trump White House, you are very welcome, <laughs> you know, and I hope you have a, a wonderful time. There's people here from the business community, and of course there are people from universities uh, and so on, uh, who are also interested in the topic. Now, when the uh, Constitutional Court made the decision, all kinds of dad jokes floated in the uh, public space. You know, jokes like, I remember trying to join that conversation and realizing I really was too old for this. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I am very active on Facebook and Twitter uh, with 103,437 followers. Uh, and my kids keep saying, Dad, do you really count that crap? You know, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and immediately the court decision came down. Some jokers went on and sort of said, oh, the high court made a joint decision. I don't think that's funny. <laughs> Between you and me, I don't think that's funny, you know. And, and, and of course, on the way from Cape Town here this afternoon, you know, I put out there and said, I can't believe I'm going to a seminar on Dacha. Uh, somebody said, at least, Prof, you're ending your year on a high note. So <laughs> we, we will not get into those kinds of ridiculous, you know, uh, that kind of ridiculous humor. But we will listen to very serious people who think about this topic uh, for a living. So uh, let me introduce them uh, each uh, uh, very quickly, and then uh, I won't say anything more and ask them to come up in the order in which their names appear in the program. First of all, Dr. A.K. Domingo, who looks suspiciously young for a <laughs> topic of this kind, but he is quite an accomplished a uh, scientist in his own right is a specialist psychiatrist and senior lecturer at uh, Stellenbosch University, uh, also medically trained uh, and, and with a master's also in psychiatry and, and a lot, uh, many more accolades. But I should add that he's continuing studying uh, uh, in addiction psychiatry at Stellenbosch and is based at the Heroin Detoxification Unit, an alcohol rehab uh, at Stickland uh, hospital. He's also a member of the South African Society of Psychiatrists Special Group on Addictions and an executive member of the South African Addiction Medical Society. So incredibly accomplished uh, 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 scientist. Then uh, also a colleague of mine at Stellenbosch, Professor Kermanthri Moodley, and she's a professor in the Department of Medicine and director of the Center for Medical Ethics and Law at Martis. She has served on too many committees, including boards of the Medical Research Council, and done amazing work in researching immunization, uh, uh, different kinds of uh, crises uh, uh, in, 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 in a field such as Ebola and dealing with vaccines and vaccinations and the like, and, and, and worked across the continent in these uh, areas. She's also very well rated by the National Research Foundation and um, uh, and is appointed to the International AIDS Society's Working Group HIV Cure, and so on. So, um, uh, and also an MBA um, graduate. So, again, a very accomplished uh, Professor K. Moodley. Then, uh, Professor Fraser McNeil, he will speak, he will be the third speaker. He's an Associate Professor of Social Anthropology at Tikkis, the University of Pretoria. He's got his PhD in Anthropology from uh, the London School of Economics uh, and has won many awards and the like in his own uh, career. He's a fascinating person because in addition to uh, his, <laughs> you know, his work uh, on science, he also does research on gossip. Don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> ethnomusicology, poisoning, uh, the anthropology of knowledge, traditional leadership and all of that and uh, is also a principal investigator of an NRF-funded project on indigenous knowledge uh, uh, systems. In his spare time, he plays a rhythm guitar in a vendor reggae band. <laughs> Let it not be said that Asif does not <laughs> bring <laughs> you colorful characters. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, uh, another accomplished colleague, Professor Eva Manieri, who is Associate Professor in the School of Nursing at Northwest University, the Mafeking campus. 
She completed a PhD in psychiatric community nursing at the same institution. She's a researcher in mental health, HIV stigma, and substance abuse and the like. And she has been appointed or was appointed as a member of the Central Drug Authority, where she uh, is responsible for the planning, coordination, and promotion of measures for the prevention and combating of drug abuse in the country. So you can see that Prof Manieri's angle on this debate is also going to be very crucial uh, for our understanding of the decriminalization of cannabis. And since 2017, she's been a member of the International Nurses Society on Addictions and part of a committee that developed the mental health policy framework and strategy through 2020. Those are our speakers. They each have seven minutes. One of them suggested that if they don't keep to the seven minutes, then a trap door will open up here <laughs> and they'll end up at Fort Hare. But uh, <laughs> 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 I, I, it's not a demotion, don't get me wrong, um, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But welcome again to all of you, our first speaker, Dr. A.K. Domingo. Okay, just a second. Thank you, Professor Janssen. Thank you to the Academy of Science of South Africa. And of course, thank you to our hosts. And thank you to everyone that's joining us here tonight. I am looking forward to it. And I am looking forward to participating in this debate. So Professor Janssen was talking about some of the <coughs> statements he's heard, some of his friends and family teasing him. One of the um, lines that I'm often told is, it's organic, don't panic. <laughs> So I'm a psychiatrist. I find the brain fascinating. I, I am concerned about the development of the brain. I'm concerned about mental illness. And as an addiction psychiatrist, I am deeply concerned about what role cannabis has in the development of the brain and what are the consequences of long-term cannabis exposure. Is there a... Go. So... In the field of neuroscience, the endocannabinoid system is a relative infant. Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and I'm sorry to use such big words at this time of day, it's unacceptable, but I'll, I'll do my best to limit them. Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol was first discovered in 1965. This was a huge discovery. It was thanks to that discovery that we were able to identify the receptors that it works on. We were able to discover the fact that our body produces its own hormones that acts on these neuro um, um, receptors. And we were able to discover the fact that the cannabis plant actually has over 500 different chemicals, at least 100, more than 100 of which act on our brain. So that's just the first one. That's just delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. These receptors that we discovered, thankfully there's only two, and thankfully the names were not too complex. We call them cannabinoid 1, cannabinoid type 2 receptors. Cannabinoid 1 is found throughout the brain, and it's important for various functions, and I'll discuss a bit of that. Cannabinoid type 2, quite interestingly, some of it's found within the brain, but it's also found within other areas of the body. It's found on immune cells, spleen, macrophages, microglial cells, and it's thought to play a role within the protective system within our body. So I mentioned that our body produces its very own endocannabinoids, these neurotransmitters that act on these receptors within our brain. We know that these neurotransmitters are important because at this point in time, we understand that our brain continues to develop up until the age of about 25. So if you are less than 25 at this point in time, well, number one, be grateful. <laughs> number two, understand that your brain is still developing. Your prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's able to assess an environment, to think of possible options in terms of how to respond to that environment and to choose that best option, that's your prefrontal cortex. The hippocampus, where we store and consolidate memory, that's still developing, and it's thanks to that endocannabinoid system that we have that it allows for those parts of the brain to develop and mature with time. So 
our brain cells are growing. They are they have synaptic formation. They have dendritic pruning that's occurring. That's being guided by the, our very own endocannabinoid system. This is really important because this is an important process of brain development. When you disadapt up this process, you allow for pathology to occur. You allow for long-term consequences to occur. And this is an important, simple concept to understand. When you expose these receptors to exogenous cannabinoids, so I'm referring to the cannabinoids that you obtain from the plant. When you expose your brain's receptors to THC, which comes from the plant, it's a major psychoactive compound within the plant, you are disadapting that process of brain development. Once you disadapt that process, you can't undo it. It's an important, pro it's an important point. So this is data that we have from Sekindu. Sekindu is our South African Community Epidemiological Network on Drug Use. They are responsible for collecting data from all rehabs of all provinces across the country. And this is the most recent data we have at this point. This is data that's in the last six months of 2017. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I only have seven minutes and that trap door will open up soon. But what it shows is that when you look at cannabis, they provide data for all age groups and they provide data for those less than 20. And they then show us what is the primary substance of abuse. For those people going to rehab, what is the drug that they are currently struggling with, their primary substance of abuse? For those less than 20 years, it is the most common primary substance of abuse in all provinces. Again, another important fact for us to be aware of. This was before decriminalization was announced. We are already struggling with cannabis addiction. When we look at all age groups, it generally um, ranks within the top four primary substances of abuse for all age groups. So we spoke about the role that the endocannabinoid system plays with regards to brain development. We spoke about the risk of addiction. What we do know at this point in time that the earlier you start using cannabis, the greater the consequences that you experience. And I think that you already understand why. Because brain development occurs at an early age and continues up until 25. If you were to start cannabis after the age of 25, there will still be consequences, but at least brain development has already stopped at that point. But there, you are still at risk of consequences, and we'll discuss that over the next two hours. Regular cannabis use in youth affects aspects of cognition, which includes attention, memory, visual spatial um, processing, and cognition as a whole, so um, intelligence. What we understand about this relationship right now is that if you were to start using cannabis at the age of, let's say, 30 and greater, and we were to do cognitive testing on you, we would find deficits. But if you were to stop your cannabis use within three months, you should return back to baseline. If you were to start cannabis use at an earlier age, the data is starting to show that there may not be a return to baseline. Then you may be left with a permanent drop in your IQ level. Early and regular use increases the risk of developing a primary psychotic illness. Anyone that's worked in the field of psychiatry will know that cannabis certainly can cause a substance-induced psychotic episode. We also have lots of evidence showing that it may be a factor that predisposes one to developing a primary psychotic illness, that being schizophrenia. So please understand that not everyone that uses cannabis will develop schizophrenia, and certainly you can develop schizophrenia without having used cannabis. Schizophrenia is a disease that is caused by multiple risk factors coming together, and we believe that cannabis is one of those risk factors. And certainly, we all appreciate what a difficult disease that is. We want to limit the risk towards developing that illness. There's evidence indicating that those who are intoxicated with cannabis are at greater risk of having motor vehicle accidents. We will certainly discuss that in greater detail over the next two hours. And there is growing evidence of the risk of um, ischemic cardiac events, such as strokes, such as heart attacks. Certainly limited evidence at this point, but that's another concerning factor that we are paying attention to. 
So yes, it is organic, but it's certainly associated with severe potential harm. Disadaption of the endocannabinoid system may be associated with severe and potentially lifelong consequences, and we need to respect that. I think that this is going to be a lively discussion and debate, and I'm sure that we will have many jokes, but we need to understand that these are severe consequences that we are speaking of, and for certain individuals, these changes are permanent. And that's something that affects an individual, a family, and a community as a well. whole. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Thank you very much to the Academy of Science for the invitation to be here this evening. Um, and thank you to Professor Janssen for the generous introduction. So um, you've already heard about the important medical effects of cannabis. And I'm going to um, speak to you a little bit more about the historical context of cannabis use globally, as well as in South Africa and look at some of the ethical and legal issues associated with the use of cannabis. So I think cannabis is an incredibly um, important uh, substance to talk about. It has been situated in a very contested space uh, from a medical perspective, from a legal perspective, from socio-political and ethical perspectives. It's also an incredibly fascinating plant. And you've already heard how many chemicals there are in the plant. Um, I was hoping you could see the first slide so that we could talk about the plant a little bit more. So when we refer to cannabis, we are usually talking about the plant and the leaves. And when we look at the flower that is produced by the female plant, that is the source um, of um, other drugs. So um, it's, it's really important that, that we understand this plant. And what is intriguing about it is if you picked a leaf from the bottom of the plant, it doesn't have the same chemical constitution as a leaf picked higher up. So um, maybe when we get the slides going again, we will be able to see that. Um, What's also interesting about, uh, so, so the flower, you know, produces marijuana, but the rest of the plant is what we refer to when we talk about cannabis. Now, um, in terms of the, the, the plant itself, you've heard about some chemical investigation that occurred only as recently as 1965. However, cannabis has been in use for more than 4,000 years. So we, we think about it historically and globally. Cannabis was used in China as far back as 2700 BC. The use there, however, was mainly medical and the seeds and the stems were used and these do not contain the psychoactive substances. So it was listed in the oldest pharmacopoeia in the world in China as far back as 2700 BC. The next country that used cannabis was um, India. And here it was used both medically, but also uh, for the psychoactive substances that it contains. And the use was closely involved with um, religion, rites, and rituals. So the use spread from the Eastern countries to the Middle East. And in terms of how it actually came to Africa, uh, there, are, there are reports that it was brought either by the Indians or the Arabs. That's not, sh not clear. But, and of course, was uh, used by the Nguni tribes and brought further south into South Africa. And of course, we know that in the southern part of Africa, we have the Khoi people and the San. And cannabis use was also documented by them. So there's a very interesting history dating back thousands of years BC to the use of this particular substance. Now, uh, the other interesting fact about cannabis use 
in, in South Africa is related to uh, the 1860s when you know uh, groups of uh, Indians were brought to KwaZulu-Natal to work as indentured laborers on the sugarcane plantations. And of course, as I said earlier, there was a, uh, quite a cons uh, considerable use of, of cannabis in India. And so cannabis was brought to South Africa uh, during the 1860s as well and used by the, um, uh, the, the indentured laborers on, on the farms. Now, this was also the time of colonial rule and their masters were particularly unhappy that uh, they were using cannabis. They were afraid it would make them lazy and non-productive. And so it was only a matter of time before they started to motivate for, legal, uh, for legislation. And uh, as you know, I mean, the pieces of legislation that came up at the time are, are incredibly, would today be incredibly controversial because many of them were named, uh, you know, after the Indians, uh, uh, the name that was used for the Indians in those days, and they were referred to as the Cooley Act of this, that, or the other. So these, these pieces of legislation were put in place to prevent the endangered laborers from using cannabis. The type of legislation was also extremely punitive because the burden of proof for cannabis lay with the accused, unlike the burden of proof for alcohol, which lays with the accuser. So those of you who are legally qualified would understand this better, and I certainly am not legally qualified, uh, but this is how I have uh, interpreted the, the literature on, on the subject. And so, if we think about cannabis use in South Africa, there's a very strong socio-political context. And this influenced some of the decision-making around decriminalization by the courts recently. So from a legal perspective, we can see that uh, there's, a, there's a contextual history and a socio-political context. When we think about the ethical uh, context around uh, a cannabis, much of our ethical decision-making revolves around uh, risks and harms uh, uh, as opposed to benefits. And when we look at cannabis, the science is complex. It is highly contested. We do not have a strong evidence base to, make, uh, to base our decisions on. We know there are a number of harms and risks. Some of these are dose dependent. Some of these depend on the type of um, the product that is being used, the duration of use, etc. So it's very, very difficult at this stage to, to establish that risk-benefit ratio in, in, that, that we depend on when we make you know, evidence-based decisions and when we deduce the ethical issues related to, to these particular um, uh, debates. So from a perspective of ethics, we look at harm, not only to individuals, but also harm to society. And so when we talk about individuals and society, this is where the right to privacy really becomes important. And as you will know, the, the decision to decriminalize was based on the right to privacy, which is documented in uh, section 14 of the Constitution. So the right to privacy is really, it's important from that perspective, but we all know that rights can be limited and even the Bill of Rights in the Constitution has a limitation clause. So you, you, we may all claim rights and we may, may all exercise rights, but there are also specific circumstances under which our rights may be limited. And so the limitation clause is really important to understand. What was important in this decision uh, made by the Constitutional Court was firstly the fact that they had to prove or they had to, the court had to be presented with sufficient evidence to show that cannabis is harmful. And that evidence was not presented to a degree that satisfied the court. A number of arguments were made and some of them included the fact that substances like tobacco and alcohol are actually more harmful to health than cannabis. And so given that cannabis and alcohol are not as tightly regulated, uh, alcohol and smoking are not as tightly regulated as cannabis, the argument was that why are we over-regulating a substance like cannabis? So that was an argument. Now, 
the other important factor was that if we cannot find a, um, that, that when, we, when we prohibit the use of a substance, we need to be sure that there is no less punitive way of restricting use. And the courts felt that there are less punitive ways of restricting use apart from simply criminalizing the possession of cannabis. Now we do know that the law as it stands, the decision made was that it is unconstitutional to criminalize the possession of cannabis by an adult in his or her private space. We will discuss later on the issues around private space, etc., because those are important to inform the debate. But as things stand, we will have to wait for the, uh, over the next two years to see how the legal process actually evolves in terms of the regulations that will be written up to amend the law sufficiently to indicate how the legal process will continue. And there is an important difference between decriminalization and legalization. And I'm sure we will have more discussions around that. So thank you. I don't have any slides anyway, so it doesn't really matter that the machine isn't working. So, uh, Okay, I'm an, I'm an anthropologist, and contrary to what a lot of people think, anthropology is not the study of how Zulu men build a hut or how vendor men make pap, right? Anthropology is the critical historical analysis of society, and I want to try and look at this particular uh, set of ideas around cannabis from an anthropological perspective. I don't speak for all anthropologists, it's a very broad school, but I have some ideas around it and people have been publishing on this. And I want to start with that specific idea that this has to be an evidence-based debate. What do we mean by evidence? What, who's evidence? And, and whose evidence is taken more seriously than, than other people's. Uh, I'm involved, uh, as Professor Janssen said, in an indigenous knowledge systems project. It's to do with male initiation, and it's to do with traditional healing. So if you say to somebody, prove it, prove it works, where do you go with that? How are you going to prove something like that? And I was thinking through these things on the way down from Pretoria today, and at O.R. Tambo Airport, there was a big sign of an American televangelist, and it said, Kinako, it's time. And here's this guy who's coming from America. He was here, I think, about a year ago, and he had about a mil half a million people mumbling in a field somewhere, right, praying for peace and love and whatever. But this, here's a perfectly legitimate poster that's up there. It's time. We're all going to pray for this. That, is this evidence-based? No, it's not. This is based on faith, but yet it's completely legitimate. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that when we say it needs to be an evidence-based debate, what exactly do we mean by evidence? We can turn to academic publications. Does anybody read the Mail and Guardian? Mail and Guardian published a very interesting article on Friday about the increase in fake science, largely through predatory journals, but the ways in which people can manipulate scientific ideas. So we need to be very careful when we talk about having this evidence-based debate. Whose evidence is taken more legitimately than others? Where is the center of gravity here? And why is it going in one specific direction? And that speaks directly to the stigmatization of cannabis use and the way that it's been stigmatized over many years. So, evidence is an issue. I also want to pick up on the historical point that Professor Moodley made, but I want to make a slightly more anthropological analysis of it. If we look over time, we can see that two things happened at, at once. There was a, a, a relatively rapid increase in industrialization and in the capitalist mode of production. At the same time, there was a relatively rapid increase in the criminalization of cannabis. 
Right? Now, why? why? Why do these two things go together? Professor Moodley suggested, and I agree, it was probably something to do with uh, productivity. Although the opposite might be the case. You might work harder, right? Um, but there's, there, there's a slightly more to this. Not just uh, was, was cannabis allowed by in, in, indentured laborers because of the work ethic. It had mystical properties to it. And if we look as anthropologists and my colleagues who are archaeologists, we can see that historically in pre-industrial societies and in early industrialization, cannabis was always seen as female, somehow as female. Uh, if anybody has tried to grow cannabis, uh, you'll know that you have to weed out the men. You have to take the men out because they pollinate the female plant and it's the female plant that gives the powerful mystical qualities that were probably related to our earliest ideas of God or religion. So as industrialization progresses, it comes with a very, very aggressive form of patriarchy. It comes with a very aggressive way of controlling things. Cannabis is a powerful female. Is there a connection between these two things? There might be. There might not be, right? But this is how anthropologists might look at this. Now, uh, that would be a, called a structuralist approach. I'm not going to use terminology, but it's male, female. Capitalism has done this. It's, capitalism is aggressive patriarchy. And we can see that with the, the phallic ar architecture that came with it, right? So there might be a relation between these two things, but we should think through them. And we shouldn't only focus on ideas of chemi chemicals and, and brains and, and how things work on an individual level. We are a human race. We've evolved together. So it's important to try and understand these things historically as collectively as we've developed as a, as a human race. Okay, so lastly, we've got different cannabis cultures in South Africa contemporary cannabis cultures. I know that very well. I play in a reggae band, right? So, uh, and I've been living in Venda, doing my research in Venda for many, many years. I want to pick up on a point from uh, Dr. Domingo. It was very important that, to notice that in societies that might not be seen as specifically developed, or maybe people that don't know about the chemical things that are going on in the brain and all these big words and things. People know that cannabis is generally for older people. It's elders that smoke it. it and that's, and, and you, it doesn't, you don't need to have big words to work that out. It's been worked out many, many years before somebody did studies on it. So it's known that it's actually for older people. Uh, and mostly it's, it's used by older people in societies out with uh, what we might call the developed West, where it's now, well, it will be eventually commercialized. So we've got different cannabis cultures. We'll speak about them. There's positive ones, there's negative ones. There's a connection between cannabis use and nyaope. And, and I think that's because of the way in which cannabis has been tied into webs of illegality. Uh, and there's no re uh, uh, we need to try and work out how to take it out of that web of illegality. But there's no direct connection between cannabis and nyaope use. The connection is that they're both illegal. So we need to think about how these things have become illegal and how they connect with each other. Um, so ultimately, in conclusion, this is, a, this is about how, we, how much we want to allow the state into our lives. Ultimately, that's what it's about. Uh, there are health risks, many of them. I've seen people have cannabis-induced psychosis. It's not a pretty sight. But there are also great benefits to it. I've seen people who are HIV positive, on ARVs, don't want to eat, take cannabis, and they get hungry again. So there are, there's a balance between these two things. And it's ultimately about whether we want the state to, to, to have a bigger influence or a less influence in, in our lives. Yes, there's issues about children. There's issues about driving. 
issues about cannabis in the workplace. That's where Parliament has to do its job. The Constitutional Court has said, here you go, we've made this decision. Parliament now has got how long? Two years to make up, uh, to make these rules now. So Parliament has to, has to do this, it has to do it responsibly, and these rules will come into place. Um, and, you know, the, the idea that because some people are affected really badly by this, the majority of people should be disallowed the benefits of it, I think doesn't make sense. My, my sister's allergic to peanuts. She'll die if she goes close to them. But you can buy them in every bar. And I'll leave it there. Thank you for inviting me to also share my bit on this um, crucial issue of uh, s cannabis. Now, um, as a member of the Central Drug Authority, after that ruling was made, the concern that we immediately noticed was that the ruling of uh, legalization of uh, cannabis for private use Okay, no, let's leave this. I'll, I'll, I'll skip because remember that when you speak last, most of what you wanted to say is already said. So <laughs> leave that I'll, so that I can wisely choose what to say. So there was no specification on the amount that could be used in private, the mode of use, whether ingesting, inhaling, smoking, and how large the cultivation area should be and how tall the plant that you can cultivate in your backyard should be. Now, that was our major concern because you can have a large field. Most of those who, uh, some of those people who come from Lesotho know that up the mountains in Lesotho, there are fields and fields of cannabis. Now, the implications for the judgment. Now, until Parliament has effected those changes that have been referred to, to the status, one can still get arrested in your home for possession of that cannabis. However, it implies that you can use the right to privacy to defend yourself if you are charged. The guidelines for cultivation of cannabis for medicinal and research purposes have been developed, as we know, by the Medicines Control Council, which is now SAPRA. So the, in 2016, the Central Drug Authority um, published the position statement on cannabis. In terms of the National Drug Master Plan, because as the CDA, our main function is to implement the uh, Prevention and Treatment of Substance Abuse Act, and we have the guideline or the strategy, which is the National Drug Master Plan. Now, in terms of the National Drug Master Plan, our approach in responding to the country's control of psychoactive substances is supply reduction, demand reduction, and harm reduction. Now, the supply reduction refers to policing efforts to curb the manufacture and the distribution of alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and other psychoactive substances. Demand reduction refers to preventive efforts to decrease the demand of such substances. And harm reduction, of course, refers to the policies and interventions that are aimed at reducing the harmful consequences of alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and other psychoactive substances. <clears throat> now, there is scientific research that has established the following. One, that there is scientific evidence that cannabis is potentially harmful. 
to individuals and to, sub, uh, to society. I'm not going to dwell on that because one of my co-presenters has already referred to that. The, res the research has also established that smoking cannabis could be linked to cardiovascular and res respiratory disorders as well as to co cognitive impairment that has been referred to and of course mental disorders. So now, if an adolescent uses cannabis during a adolescent stage, because this is a crucial development stage, it's, it's, uh, uh, that, that exposes uh, the person to higher risk of developing I mean psychotic disorders in later life, of course. And the risk is, of course, related, could be related to the dose. A sudden use of cannabis has also been proved to account for an increased risk of motor vehicle accidents and fatal crashes. And smoking daha could also cause feelings of euphoria, occasional hallucinations, false perceptions, and short-term memory loss. There is also proof that when taken with alcohol, it may cause aggression. That I think uh, 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 we have witnessed in one way or the other. I mean, the fact that at our schools these days, there is so much aggression. And do we ever ask ourselves where that aggression comes from? In one of the local schools where I reside, teachers discovered that there is this young man who is always there during break and the, the whole lot of children queue uh, to that man. The man has got a bag full of oranges. But at the end of the break, that whole queue has not, has not uh, 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 I mean, a bag of oranges is still full. <laughs> now teachers ask themselves, but why are these children queuing for? because the man is having a bag full of oranges. There was a long, very long queue during break, but it's the end of the break. The queue is finished, but a bag of oranges is still full. <laughs> so one teacher <clears throat> took it upon herself to observe what is ex actually happening there. And guess what? The children were not buying oranges, of course, as it was obvious, but they were getting little parcels from the gentlemen. Now, the teachers would be surprised that after break, children are you know, manifesting with different types of behaviors. They are giggling. Some you know, are aggressive and all those things. Now, that causes concern. Now the benefits, I will skip those that have been said. Now various products of the cannabis plant that are available in several countries contain psychoactive ingredients that could treat medical conditions such as nausea, after chemotherapy, pain and spasticity. There is also ongoing interest in the use of psychoactive ingredients of the cannabis plant in various other medical contexts including for weight gain in HIV positive patients. However, there are relatively few rigorous data in this area and little is known about the safe dosages um, of that. Now the recommendations suggested by the Central Drug Authority Efforts of harm reduction have been particularly poorly resourced in South Africa, and given the enormous profits made by the liquor industry, it's a need, there is a need and obligation for the industry to be substantively more involved in evidence-based harm reduction efforts. In terms of cannabis, local school survey data suggest high rates of experimentation during early adolescence, as I've already alluded to the example that I gave. Of course, small children 
for the child to be uh, considered as, you know, viable and normal, they have to exper experiment. And unfortunately, some of the things that they experiment with will cause harm to them. Evidence-based interventions that include a strong focus on harm reduction are also needed in the, in, uh, within the adolescence because it comprises a large proportion of South Africans. Now, I believe that me and you want uh, the next generation, those that will follow after us, you want leaders out of them, you want responsible academics out of them. So if we do not attend to this problem, we may end up with a doomed future in South Africa. Now, conclusions based on my personal view. Given the legalization, I think all products with the ingredients of cannabis plant should be sub subjected to uh, evaluation by SAPRA. SAPRA is the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority Evaluation, the former MCC. This will eliminate doubts regarding the medicinal use. More research should also uh, focus on the medicinal use for various medical conditions rather than just a blanket generalization, particularly in the South African context. Now, I usually give an example of Moringa. Most of you know that the Moringa plant has been tested to have um, multiple nutritional uh, values or benefits. But those values are based on whether when you eat, when you ingest a, a Moringa. But when you, you inhale Moringa, will it give you the same benefits or it will cause harm to you? It's a question to reflect on. Thank you. Okay, so it's been a long day for many of you, and I'm not going to do what we had planned to do, which is to, for me to start engaging the panel. I think I'm going to turn it right over to the audience. Uh, but um, would you mind uh, going onto the stage so that people can see you? Um, we do have some refreshments afterwards in the lobby. It's, uh, it's oranges. <laughs> and... <laughs> Please join the queue. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a very lively audience. I love the energy in the room. I can see there's a whole lot of uh, comments and questions. Let me open it up to you. Do we have uh, some runners with microphones to help me? And uh, uh, that would be really great. Thanks, guys. Uh, let me start with you, sir. Since you're here, let me give you... Ik wil een vraag vragen voor uh, dokter Domingo. Eerst is, daar is drie species van cannabis. Wat er in die minste of die meeste THC? En je hebt in jouw presentatie uh, verwijst naar mensen waar dit gescheid het. Die THC van die goed. Hoe het hulle dit gedoen? Baie dankie. Ek wil vir professor Moodley vraag, wat is die medische effekte? Uh, dan, want dit is vir my baie eenzijdig hierdie aanbieding. Daar word nie na die medische effekte verwees nie. Dit is net die psychologische of die psychological effekte wat daarna verwees word. En dan... Ja, ek wil net... Okay, so I think not everybody understands Afrikaans. So, uh, Dr. Domingo, did you, do you understand what the UM asked? Could you just repeat it in English so everybody understands? Sure, so to my memory, the first question was around the three species of the cannabis plant and which one has the highest concentration of THC. Um, I apologize, what was the second question? Uh, the second is for Professor Moody, so just... No, he actually that. had two for me. So you mean linked to that one? And how, how would they separate? 
So in terms of the first question, there are three species. It's Cannabis sativa, Intica, and Ruderalis. The best known or the most commonly used one is Cannabis sativa. Um, in terms of the THC content, that really just refers to or would depend on how the plant is cultivated. Over the years, we've been cultivating and growing the plant to ensure that it has a high concentration of THC. When we talk about how potent a plant is or how good the plant is, perhaps, we're referring to the THC content. That is the ingredient that causes the, like I said, it's the psychoactive ingredient. So it's the one that would cause us to feel high, to feel intoxicated, to feel calm. It is a downer. Um, so over the years, most um, cultivators have been growing the plant to ensure a high concentration of THC. Now remember, I said that there are over 100 different chemicals that act on the brain. Another important chemical is cannabidiol. Cannabidiol, and, and I'm sorry, is it okay if I just continue for a bit longer? Uh, just for, a, yeah, yeah. I won't uh, be too long. Brief. Cannabidiol and THC, in fact, have an entourage effect. It's pretty interesting. Cannabidiol, uh, THC activates the can endocannabinoid receptor. Cannabidiol acts to block that THC. Uh, it acts to prevent the activation of that receptor. And when you increase the THC content, you automatically decrease the cannabidiol content. There's a lots of literature coming out about the potential benefits of cannabidiol. We are not at a point where we would recommend it for medicinal purposes, but certainly this is a growing area of interest um, and the potential benefits are outstanding. Okay. Now, Professor Mutli, the, the question of so much uh, work has been done on the medical aspects, uh, sorry, on the psychosocial aspects, but uh, what the gentleman is also asking, what about the medical evidence uh, mm -hmm. in regards yes. to cannabis? So um, the American Medical um, American uh, Academy of Medicine has produced a very comprehensive report, and I would advise you to Google this report and have a look at it, uh, where they have actually graded the different types of evidence. Now we're talking about sci the scientific evidence for for use of cannabis. And they certainly have found that there is moderate level evidence. So when we talk about scientific evidence from a Western perspective, uh, evidence might be strong, moderate, m minimal, or there may be no evidence at all. So they have found moderate evidence for use in some conditions like uh, multiple sclerosis, for example. Uh, certainly, uh, other reports show evidence uh, of benefit where pain is concerned, uh, where nausea is, you know, nausea induced by a very strong uh, on oncology drugs. So patients who have cancer and are taking a very strong medication and have severe nausea, it might be useful in, in, in those situations. Uh, as uh, Prof Professor McNeil mentioned earlier, there is a role uh, for uh, to increase appetite in patients on antiretrovirals. So there is certainly some benefit that comes out of these. Remember, the original use was in, was in China, and it was for medicinal purposes. Um, there, the, the products used were, did not contain the psychoactive substances. So there is a very long history of use for medicinal purposes in various cultures around the world. Thank you. Thank you for being brief as well. Um, yes, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Joanne Anthony Good, and I'm an attorney here in Port Elizabeth, and I deal specifically with family law issues. And one of the concerns that I have is that I've seen in my own practice how drug use, and specifically the use of cannabis um, and marijuana um, specifically, has become quite a more aggressive factor in the breakdown of families. With regards to the legalization or the decriminalization of cannabis, one of my biggest concerns is that in the legislation that is to be um, promulgated is the fact that we need to have age appropriate use, um, specifically in the personal, uh, specifically relating to children. It is absolutely frightening that children have got access to this drug, um, as you say, with a bag of oranges, um, and they have re really got no idea about the negative consequences that flow. I don't doubt 
for one minute that uh, cannabis has an amazing uh, medical properties, specifically for HIV patients, specifically for cancer. So I, I understand the argument of harm um, versus benefits. But one of my one of my concerns is is that as um, from the psychiatric point of view is how are we going to um, have a voice in that legislative process specifically to save our children? We've just had an incident in Port Elizabeth over the weekend where there were a, a number of um, drug related um, overdoses um, in respect of children under the age of 18, and um, I, I really feel that you know we, the, the jokes are all good and fine and well, but at the end of the day. Do you not believe that from a social point of view that the chemical side of the, the science of the cannabis and the long preju prejudicial consequences that the children need to be educated about this serious drug, the benefits as well as the risks? That is fantastic. Can I ask these two speakers to respond? Uh, Professor Magnetti and Professor McNeil? Do you want to take a... Yeah, thank you. Mm. I think it's a very important um, concern that you, you have. We all have that concern. But as the Central Drug Authority, we have certain government departments um, included. The Department of Basic, Basic Education is one of them, as well as the, the, the Department of Higher Education, where I think that as the CDA will have an opportunity to make an input into uh, 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 that uh, type of leg legislation that will, um, so I, I do have hope that we will get that opportunity because we, we do work with uh, various also NGOs from the communities. We, log we work with local uh, drug action committees that are from all the local authorities in the country. So I, I think okay. through that route, we will be able to make an input. I wonder, Professor Neil, when you respond, could you also just, I, I, I'm not a legal person either, but the, the, what is the meaning in the ruling of private use? Maybe you can also speak to that in, in responding. Uh, maybe I could, or maybe, maybe I could pass it on to Professor Middle. Uh, you speak about the breakdown of families, and you relate that to cannabis use. Um, I quite strongly disagree with that. Um, I think family breakdown is, is, is a wider societal issue related to the economic inequality that we have in this country. And so we've, we've got the, 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 the worst Gini coefficient on the planet in this country. So you can't take one substance and say families are breaking down because of cannabis. Um, I think you need to look at the wider societal issues uh, families have always been a place for abuse, by the way, and fa you know, families have always been a place for domestic abuse, child abuse. It's generally somebody you know that does that. You'll know that. You're, a, you're an attorney that deals with children. So don't use cannabis as a scapegoat. No, I'm not using cannabis as a scapegoat. Okay, just hang on to that. Uh, okay, guys, I think try and hear out the persons. This is not a Pentecostal church, so you don't have to... <laughs> Uh, I have to clap for everything, and I will get to every, hang on, I will get to every hand, but what we're really trying to get at here, unlike a political meeting, is we're really trying to get at what do we know, what is the science as best we know it for the moment, okay, so, so, I don't know if what Professor McNeil said is true, though, uh, you know, if you simply say, that, uh, dumb this under inequality, you have a hard time explaining you know, uh, the opioid crisis in the US, which is largely a middle class and upper middle class problem. So I don't know if this is simply a gynae coefficient story, but, but let's keep going and I'll come, I'll come back to you. Professor Ridley, did you okay. want to? Yes, I think that the issue around private space is important. So, so it, it, it could be that, you know, private space means within your own home only. But there is also the concept of private use, which is different from private space. So it is possible that private use is also not de is also decriminalized as part of this the current uh, uh, legislation, but there will be a two year period for everybody to give input into the development of the final legislation, and I think that is imp it's it's really important that civil society engages at that level. In that. Thank you very much. I, I want to go towards the back, sir, and then I'll come to you, sir. Can we start, gentlemen, yeah, and then... 
Thank you, Chair. I, I, my question is directed perhaps, or my comments to Dr. Domingo and uh, Professor Mandietti, um, essentially. Um, we hear that the effects, the harmful effects, are perhaps age-related, and that the elderly are not as impaired as very young people. Um, I have a 96-year-old aunt who's on prescription cannabis, but she lives in San Francisco. And whenever I speak to her once a month, she sounds happy. <laughs> and uh, arthritis seems to be in check. But my concern, uh, Chair, and to the panel, is that of the unborn child. We know the fetal alcohol syndrome problems in South Africa, in fact, in this very region, and also smoking-related effects on unborn children. Um, perhaps to Dr. Domingo and Professor Manieri, what is the incidence of use of cannabis amongst pregnant women in South Africa? So, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, when it comes to studying the effect that a particular substance can have on the unborn infant, it's a particularly difficult area to study because there are various confounding factors. Usually when people who are pregnant use cannabis, they use other substances as well. Usually individuals who are using cannabis during pregnancy may be suffering from various psychiatric disorders, from socioeconomic difficulties. All of these factors can influence the infant and the pregnancy itself. So it's very difficult for us to determine that. Unfortunately, I cannot give you the statistic, and I'm not sure if we are aware of that in terms of the prevalence of cannabis use amongst um, uh, pregnant mothers. In terms of the effects, what we do know is that cannabis is a highly lipophilic substance, so it absorbs into fatty tissues quite easily. It can cross a um, placental barrier, and it's also released in breast milk. In fact, the concentration in your breast milk is higher than the concentration found in the bloodstream of mothers. So a higher amount of THC is released in breast milk. What we do believe is that there's evidence to show that infants born to moms who are using cannabis tend to have a lower birth weight, and also there are concerns of neurodevelopmental deficiencies um, after birth. So the in indeed, there are consequences associated with cannabis use during pregnancy. Not, not more than that. <laughs> uh, gentleman at the back there? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Mm, my name is Simpiwe. I, I would be glad if maybe there was, uh, maybe among you, just any, like any organic person or somebody that have lived and researched or even smoked marijuana. Because, uh, because, because there's there's always a constant contestation there. Even, even what has come out of court uh, has been some has been a victory to some, and has also been a, a loser to some. Uh, I, I'll tell you why I say this. I, I grew up in a place. Some of my brothers were smoking marijuana, but. I have never seen some of the symptoms people were saying, like aggressive and everything. The only thing that I would notice when people smoke marijuana, they may be high and get slower in talking and all those things, but there's no crime and stuff. I mean, I also know that in many years we were told that Bob Marley died of marijuana, but, uh, but I've, I've seen that now in this, uh, uh, What's good, in, in some of the research that are coming, in some of the findings that uh, Bob Marley really never died of the marijuana, but it was some of the evil works of some scientists. I mean, I mean those, uh, those are the things that are there that really to people. But, uh, but, uh, but I want to agree actually to, to, to some people uh, like, uh, what they say that, uh, I would agree that marijuana is not really for the young people. I've seen that actually for any drug, even for alcohol, even for sex, it's not for young people. <laughs> so, so I would agree with that because when older people are using marijuana, you, you, there's no stories around. That's number one. 
And, uh, and number two, in terms of the disorders, you know, some of the disorders which were mentioned from marijuana are really not true. I mean, versa V to the smoking. I mean, smoking, even on the cover of the cigarette, you will see there that, please note, smoking is a health risk, it's dangerous. So smoking is killing and everything. So, uh, you know, marijuana cannot be so big. I don't know who even died of marijuana, actually. You know, something. But lastly, in terms of the aggression in schools, it's also to me does not make sense. You know, in the township where I live, I know even some people are not honest in using marijuana today. They are using marijuana in mixing with the cocaine or even with the mandrax. Even with the nyayupa, you can know that, you know, where I live, I don't think even there's an honest, pure rasta far end sometimes because because i i don't see them smoking just that thing they smoke it with the mandrax so so probably the aggression part that i see the killing like in helenville in motherwell in these places where young people are killing it it, it is out of the getting the marijuana mixing with all those kind of things and alcohol and they come out of the aggressive and and again being young people themselves. Okay. So they come, uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, sir. I think the question was, can anybody here on the panel speak from the authority of experience? <laughs> <laughs> There's some denial here, brother. I don't know what to do with it, you know. <laughs> I think the mic is being given to the brother from Venda, so we got to... <laughs> No comment. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I tried, I tried. On the last question, yes, I can. Uh, um, and I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of the participants here, if they're honest enough, will probably also admit to the experience. Um, many of the people who tried to get here to this meeting this evening wanted to get here, but then they got high. <laughs> uh, so that explains some of the empty chairs here. But on a serious note, um, I think this is uh, largely a scientific debate, and I like the idea of the science, but I think you need to be very careful about science and how we perceive science. And I, like, and I want to appreciate the fact that uh, that science to a large and scientific evidence to over many, many years have been manufactured. And for various reasons, for political and mostly for economic reasons. Uh, and the first pharmacy, we mustn't, we mustn't underestimate the power of big pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and big pharma and, and, and the extent that they have influenced uh, scientific evidence uh, and the manufacture of scientific evidence. So, I really appreciate the fact that you put that firmly and squarely on the table. I'm also concerned about some of the terms that we use in a scientific debate such as the potential for and the risk of without the proof of the potential and the risk and the, the, and the unilateral uh, positioning of cannabis without comparative analysis of other things that might have similar effects, such as cardiovascular risk, alcohol business, cannabis in terms of cardiovascular disease, uh, motor vehicle accidents, and the, the comparative analysis. 2.6 for cannabis, how much for alcohol? <coughs> how much for smoking, and so on and so forth. So we need to put things into perspective in a scientific kind of debate, so that there is a comparative analysis in terms of what is acceptable and what's not, not acceptable. Talking about contested space, contested space in terms of what? In terms of our own prejudices, yes, certainly. Because cannabis is it, 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 it is controversial, yes, certainly. I come from Cape Town, and the term ruka comes from uh, is, uh, derived from ruka, uh, old dacha ruka, and that ruka is uh, cannabis smoking is a dacha ruka as associated with gangsters. So we come up with prejudices. People in the Rugby World Cup next year will have to cover up the tattoos because tattoos have been associated, well, not associated with Japan, 
with the uh, gangsterism and, and belonging to the Yakuza gangs, uh, the Yakuza gangs. So now we're dealing with contested space in what context? Because of our own prejudices and the prejudices that we've been uh, uh, allowed to go on. So um, I'd like to put the old question of the risk to children in context. The only stimulus that children need to be exposed to is education. And we as adults need to make sure that is the only stimulus that children must be exposed to. No other drugs, no other artificial stimulants, and we as a society must make sure that everything must be put in place to protect children from any other harmful effects other than cannabis, alcohol, bad social behaviors and among other things and we don't speak up often enough against the bad influences children get exposed to, <laughs> not just cannabis. All right. Thank and you, lastly, sir. I just want to thank the, the, the individual for saying that cannabis is a powerful woman, a woman and the property must be made to make me more attractive to it. <laughs> Uh, okay, I was going to ask the gentleman what uh, what is a uruka and whether that's a distinctive uh, thing. But anyway, go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate this opportunity to be amongst... Um, uh, you guys uh, tonight and um, just talking about some something very interesting um, to the panelist um, maybe my question is directed to Prof Manyendi or Prof Modli I've always uh, struggled to to find the logic in qualifying a, a plant as a drug and subjecting a plant to drug control laws how does that get to happen should it maybe uh, be under plant control laws or something? <laughs> because there are, I, I know when it comes to uh, the Caribbean region, there are many uh, strong and uh, dark plants, and um, some of those plants have been, you know, um, subjected under laws. But I, I just want to find out. <laughs> All right. What are the processes by which uh, these classifications take place? Anyone? Heroin comes from the opium plant. Cocaine comes from a plant. When a particular plant it causes psychoactive, has psychoactive properties and has the potential for abuse, then there are certain regulatory mechanisms that have to be applied to it. I'm afraid that's the only answer that I can right. provide to that. Is it possible to respond to the previous comments? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. Um, I think more than one individual has stated that we really must psychoeducate their, our, our youth so that they know not to use it. I apologize. I do love evidence. So I'm going to bring it up again. That doesn't work. Unfortunately, going to schools and telling kids not to do something when tested has been shown not to work. Um, we talk about, when, when we look at what are the risk factors for individuals developing an addiction, I'm sure there are many people in this room that have used cannabis and I assume that most of you are not addicted to it. But we do know that some individuals do become addicted to a substance, do become addicted to alcohol, do become addicted to other substances. What are the risk factors? What determines why certain people develop an addiction and certain do not? Genetics does play a huge role, but then there are other factors. The acceptability and accessibility of a substance plays a huge role in determining how frequently someone will use a substance and the risk of then becoming addicted to that substance. There's lots of evidence, well not lots, but there's a growing amount of evidence showing that when laws change, when laws change with regards to legalization for medicinal purposes or recreational purposes, the youth's perception of the safety of that drug changes accordingly. So they don't read the finer detail. They don't look at why was cannabis decriminalized in South Africa. It's not about the 
right of an individual in their private space, their perception is, well, it must be safe, it must be okay. I've heard that over and over from adults. Of course the youth will think that. So accessibility, acceptability plays a role. The age of initiation and parental role modeling plays an important role. If it is in your back garden, it is easily accessible. It is easier to use it at an earlier age. If they see their parents using it, there is a sense of acceptability. There is a role modeling that is occurring. No amount of professionals coming to a school telling them that it's not safe to use is ever going to compare to you seeing your parent use that drug. Yes, of course, that is an important point that you played with regards to how does it compare to a, another substance. Alcohol by far is a much greater risk for causing motor vehicle accidents. By far kills people because of cardiovascular disorders. But we are not saying that we are substituting cannabis for alcohol. We are saying in the country that we live, where alcohol is abused, where we are known to use alcohol in a hazardous manner. We are in the top five countries when it comes to the use of alcohol in a hazardous pattern. We binge drink over weekends. In this country that we live, where there are socioeconomic differences, where there is poverty, where there is gangsterism, where there is alcohol abuse, how will we cope with the easier access to cannabis? Which is actually the question we should be asking. because they uh, represent different perspectives from chemistry to anthropology uh, to medicine and so on. Uh, so that they have different views. And I think this is important for us. To, you don't get to the truth, you know, with, uh, with uh, one stubborn view uh, of the world. I'd like to give the gentleman over there a chance back and then the lady in front. I would just like to add that we should have the right as adults to decide for ourselves. It's like the same old story with the lobbyist for and against uh, actual firearms. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. I've seen more unhappiness with alcohol in homes than what I've so far seen with cannabis. I grew up on the Cape Flats. The neighbors next door to me used to sing on a Friday night and have a couple of beers and smoke their weed used to walk through my room as if I was smoking more than them. <laughs> I fortunately have never tried it. I, don't, I cannot say it's wrong or right. All I'm saying is we should be afforded, we adults, we come from an era where it was dictated to us how we had to think, what we had to think, and when we could do what. We should now be afforded the opportunity to behave like adults and to make our own assessments as adults. Point taken. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I just want to say I'm a scientist and, um, and my research is on the receptors of cannabis. So I'm, I'm looking at the medical aspect of it and doing research on um, uh, scientific research um, or medical research, big pharma can't affect or uh, influence my publication because on every uh, publication that you want to publish, you have to declare whether you have any conflict of interest. So if Big Pharma affect you in your research, then, then you have to declare it. So that is just um, that there is but much more um, that it is actually um, say, say that, that the, um, that the information that we get is skewed because it is influenced by the media where scientists try to have it not influenced. What I actually want to ask is, we know that um, cannabis can contribute to um, motor car uh, accidents. It was said as well. And then uh, one of the speakers said that he grew up amongst people and you can see they become more calm and so on. So, so, and that is what has been proven that it, that they, your reaction time is slower. So it influence um, car accidents. Now, this whole thing that you can, you can use it in privacy in your own private uh, area, so you can do alcohol. 
there is nothing against the law to use it in your private but there is if you go out of your private space and you draw drive a car under the influence of alcohol you can put other people's lives at risk and therefore they have a, a test to say you can take so much alcohol before you can drive a car but there's no test as far as i know available on the south african roads to say if a person have taken in cannabis that they can't drive so um, can that be, how can we influence the legislation so that, you know, there may be limits of in what limits people can actually be? Very good point. Uh, thank you. Ruby? No, I'll, um, I'll follow up with a question, not, not to respond to that. No, I'm going to just let a few questions oh, run before we conclude. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, maybe just in response to the previous uh, speaker, uh, Prof. Roo, um, when I submitted my, my PhD was on um, uh, cannabis, um, exposure to cannabis um, in an in a obese rat model. And it was submitted to an international journal and it took about a year for it to be published because they were waiting on um, uh, an international study, actually two studies to be um, uh, to, for the results of that, just to, to check um, whether it does um, uh, correspond to what I found in my study. So, um, as far as editorial boards are concerned, I'm, I'm sorry to say there is definite influence um, still within, um, most of them have got pharmacology um, uh, companies that actually sponsor them, so it does influence. Um, my question is, Many countries have legalized cannabis. Um, and they range from first um, your, your um, first world countries to third world countries to emerging markets. Has a study, any of the panelists, has a study been conducted, a meta-analysis been conducted, where the socioeconomic and psychological, psychiatric um, impact of the use of cannabis within those um, different um, environments in terms of what, what it has done with criminality, what it has done in terms of psychiatric illness, what it has done in terms of, okay, we know that it creates a lot of jobs, um, but also um, just in terms of um, wellness generally or not. Criminality, has it increased because um, as some of the panel said, yes, it, it, it might have its detrimental effects, but surely we need to look at it holistically, as was um, suggested. And there's already been um, legalization that happened elsewhere. So can't we learn from that? And then based on what has been collected, data that has been collected, do a proper analysis and see how that can possibly inform us in terms of what to possibly expect in terms of the effects of such legalization. Excellent point. I'll take two more questions and then we're done. And then I'll ask the panel just to summarize. Hello. Hello. Moloeni. Goedemiddag allemaal. Now, I'm glad, Mr. MC, that you addressed the fact that this is not a Pentecostal church. However, just like people will root for the Spirit of God in a Pentecostal church, I feel like people will root for a spirit over here. And thank you, Mr. Scotsman. I'm sorry, I'm bad with names. I <laughs> thought the Scottish were bold and courageous, but yet you hide behind a no comment. So I'll be the first one to say, my hair, this is how long I've been clean for from weed. And Mr. Scotsman, I'm sure you'd know if you ever smoked weed as my guitar teacher would have, like, would have told you, he knew the first time that I was high in a guitar lesson simply because I was mucking up my scales horrifically. Like, it just slows you down. We know this. People. <laughs> I feel like we are overlooking the question, is this not spiritual? And I'm glad you raised the point, because people will root for this. If, if you're supporting cannabis, they'll root for it like you're in a church, they'll root for it. Are we not overlooking the fact that this is spiritual? And Double HP, who is a poet like me, is not here with us today. Why? Because he had access to something that should have brought him happiness, and because of depression, he's not with us. Is it possible that something that is giving us instant gratification to happiness 
as soon as it's not there, we realize, but where is the happiness? Is it not aggression? If you're murdering yourself, I don't know, I think this is spiritual. Is it spiritual? I feel like people should be speaking out of experience from the front. This does concern our country. Thank you. I never thought we could bring poetry into the discussion. I think that was, that was wonderful. That was very well done. And finally, sir. Uh, thank you. I wanted, to, I wanted to hear from the colleagues, because they so, so many of them are involved in national programs. What was their view on the, on the judgment? You know, were they surprised? Uh, is the judgment, uh, you know, uh, uh, faulty? Is it uh, too simplistic? And then, together with that, I have extreme fears. With our parliament being left with the responsibility of working out the rules, we've had far less complicated situations. And, and, and then, lastly, if you will allow me, I feel that in South Africa, we have a current situation of a, a growing numbers of Rastafarian communities. I am parenting, or I'm a parent of a Rastafarian family, and I certainly see different Rastafarian uh, uh, values, ethics, and so forth, and Perhaps that should be a subject of study so that we can probably determine the risk and safeguards in, in South Africa with this new uh, development. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, yeah, I thought you were skeptical about Parliament, but the, there was evidence that if, uh, if you can slow down the reaction, you, know, <laughs> you might just get Parliament to be more sober. But anyway. Um, <laughs> You guys have the last word, a closing comment. Shall I start in the reverse order? Perhaps, Prof. Uh, Manierik, if we could start with you, and then I'll just go to Dr. Domingo. Yeah, I think um, in responding to you, we were not really surprised, given the fact that other countries have already legalized. And if you, 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 you trace back, there has been, you know, there has been a, a more debate on legalization of marijuana for uh, medicinal use. So we were anticipating that, that very soon South Africa would also um, legalize it for medicinal use. Of course, as we know that the M the M U with regard to the M MCC, we know that it has been a, a, a law that if you, if any doctor would like to prescribe uh, cannabis for medicinal use for their patients, there is a process to follow. They apply to uh, the, 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 the SAPRA to get uh, 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 that authorization to prescribe it for their patients. So I think we had anticipated that that would uh, uh, finally come, that it will be completely legalized. But as we have already said, there are concerns, there are, you know, uh, much that has to be done because, you know, South Africa is a very interesting community. Whatever, you know, we, we use things, you know, differently from other countries and we always find a way of, you know, <laughs> benefiting from whatever, you know, laws or whatever or even misusing or abusing the laws to our own benefit. So that is, that is a, a, a concern. Thank you. Thanks. I would just like to reply to f some specific points. Um, the scientist, you didn't give your name, you just said you're a scientist. Uh, you spoke about wanting to know about driving and measuring THC levels. Uh, in Canada, uh, they actually did work on a roadside test that you can use as a breathalyzer test. Um, so that, that technology does exist. It just hasn't been developed so far in South Africa. Uh, the gentleman at the back who has now left raised a really interesting point. No, I'm not going to speak to you who called me a coward, that's all right. <laughs> no, I'm joking, man. The, the gentleman at the back raised a really interesting point about 
sitting in a room and smelling cannabis smoke coming into the room. And to me, that raises the issue of this problematic notion of private space. When, when you're smoking in your private space and it goes into another person's house, is it still your private space? So Parliament has got a, a, a big job to do in trying to define these, the, 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 these, these boundaries. Um, and the notion of plants and, and how they become criminalised or uh, from an anthropological perspective, as a medical anthropologist, it's very clear that as soon as a plant has a potential to change your consciousness, it will be seen as a threat to social control, threat to social order, and it will be brought under some kind of legislation. And that's happened throughout history, cross-culturally. Um, so the state will find a way, certain states will find a way to, to try and control substances that can possibly uh, interfere with social control uh, and prohibition in America was a classic example. And lastly, I'm more than happy to give you lots of anthropological references on studies of Rastafarianism and the way in which the, the specific cannabis culture of Rastafarianism leads to a very specific ethos. Uh, which I think is quite a, a positive way of life. So, thanks. So, thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful to hear so many diverse perspectives. I think a very strong underlying theme here is a, a discussion around um, a debate that's been brewing in this country for a while, and that is the decolonization of knowledge and the decolonization of science. And I think cannabis is just such a prime example for us to work with in this respect. We need to be clear about what we mean by decolonization, another contested uh, topic. But the, the bottom line is that we also have depended excessively on the empirical method in science. And, um, uh, you know, the, the constant uh, discussions around Western science and the empirical way of, of getting evidence for everything. But the source of knowledge often runs much further back than Western medicine and Western science. And we need to acknowledge and investigate those aspects of our history more carefully. Uh, so I think, I think cannabis is really going to, to accelerate discussions and debates around decolonization. The second important issue, I think, uh, will revolve around the legislation and how it's going to pan out over the, ne the next two years. We know that cannabis uh, is legalized in 33 jurisdictions around the world. So we certainly have many examples to learn from, with Canada being one of the most recent countries uh, with, with quite extensive legislation. And if you look at some of the data uh, relating to the Canadian legislation, they've already indicated quantities, etc., in more specific detail. We hope that will emerge in the parliamentary discussions around this legislation. The, the issue around age, so, so although decriminalization currently applies to adults using the substance, so who is an adult in South Africa, according to the law, it's anyone over the age of 18. But if we look at the period of adolescence, when the brain development is really critical and the impact on brain development is important, People define adolescence uh, ranging from the age of 22 to 24. So if we stick by the legal guidelines, we are actually going to miss those important years when cannabis can still be harmful to the adolescent brain. So the law certainly will have to take that into account. And then we need to look at the Tobacco Control Act. And so when we look at private space there, you, you may smoke in your own home, but you may not smoke if you have a domestic worker or a gardener in your own home and in your private space. So it's also about which people do you invite into your private space who may not approve of your use of tobacco or smoking cannabis. And of course, impact on neighbors, etc., has already been discussed. So I think the law is complex and we need to get it right. And the way to get it right is for civil society to engage very actively in these debates. We often sit back, we allow the, the process to continue, and then when it's too late, we criticize. So I think it's really important for us to engage at all levels in how the legislation will eventually pan out in South Africa. Thank you. 
Um, if it's okay, I'd like to touch on the driving question, the laws, as well as medicinal purposes, using cannabis for medicinal purposes. So with regards to driving, that's certainly going to be an important aspect going forward. Quite recently, within the past two weeks, on the news, we heard of a company firing a number of drivers because they tested positive for cannabis. So in terms of testing for cannabis, you can test urine, but unfortunately, because cannabis is lipophilic, it, if you use a large amount of cannabis, you can continue to test positive for up to a month after last using. That's if you were a frequent user and you're using high doses. Indeed, we can test saliva. Saliva, unfortunately, is not an accurate means of determining how intoxicated someone is. It's not an accurate reflection of the blood concentration. But it becomes more complicated. When you use cannabis, immediately your blood concentration increases within the first two hours, and then it decreases after that. Um, the problem is that even though your blood concentration is decreasing, the effect that it has on your psychomotor performance is still present. So internationally, there's no real consensus in terms of how best to test someone in terms of their risk on the road. In Australia, if they... so. No one, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong on this, but no one, to my knowledge, will prosecute someone based on saliva testing. You would have to have blood testing. In Australia, a level of two nanograms per mole is considered to be positive, and you will face a hefty fine for that. In America, they use five nanograms per mole, which they believe is to be you know, the equivalent of being positive and the equivalent of being a risk. But still, even at a later stage, you will continue to be a risk. The Australians feel, you know, Anything positive, you are at risk and you will, you'll be fined for that. The problem is that we don't know, and that is the conclusion that we have right now, is we don't have an accurate means of testing to determine what the risk is. And this form of testing is very expensive. I'm not quite sure if it's available in our country just yet. With regards to the laws, I was, I'm probably quite naive and I was quite surprised by the change. Um, if you look at international policies, countries will either decide to decriminalize or legalize. Decriminalize means taking away the criminal penalty associated with using. And countries that decriminalize do it because they feel if you're addicted to a substance, you shouldn't have to go to jail for that. And that's not an adequate means of remedying the problem. But when you decriminalize a substance, there is still a criminal penalty for growing and selling because they feel you know, the drug addict should be punished, but the drug dealer should be punished. So you can go to jail for that. When you legalize a substance, you have to then say, are you legalizing it for medicinal purposes or for recreational purposes? So for medicinal purposes, you can grow and sell, but only for people who have certain specific medical conditions. If you can legalize for recreational purposes, you know it's free for all. The problem with, or the difficulty that I personally have is that we are about to enter a phase where we can grow cannabis for personal reasons. So technically, I mean, I'm not quite sure which definition we're following. We're allowing to grow a substance, so technically that's more than just decriminalizing, but it's only for personal reasons. Um, you need to understand that while it's not that difficult to grow the plant, it becomes technical. When companies, and I agree, big pharma is a big concern, but when companies grow cannabis, there are very strict rules that apply to that. You need to make sure, you, think you need to test the soil. You need to make sure that there's no bacteria. You need, they use gamma radiation to get rid of the bacteria. This is a plant that actually attracts all the heavy metals in soil. If you wanted to rehabilitate your soil, grow hemp. It actually absorbs all the heavy metals and then absorbs it into its own tissues. Or sometimes it's what's known as that drug dealers will add heavy metals to increase the weight so that they can sell more of it. There's a case series of 95 people having lead poisoning because lead was added to it. There are case series of people having salmonella, Klebsiella infection because bacteria was added to it. We speak of you know patients with HIV using it to gain weight. The problem is that these are patients who are immunocompromised, fungal spores are known to be on this plant, you are increasing the risk of fungal pneumonia, <laughs> uh, fungal infections. Um, when we speak of cannabis for medicinal purposes, yes, there is some evidence showing that there's modest quality evidence for certain conditions. 
but we don't have long-term evidence. So we have moderate quality evidence for pain, perhaps. There's a four-year prospective study being released from Australia showing that people with chronic non-cancer pain using cannabis on top of the medication did worse. Their pain was worse, their anxiety was worse. They did not stop using opioids. It becomes really boring to go into the nitty-gritty details of it, but unfortunately the devil is in the details and we do need to talk about it, we do need to understand it because you run the risk of long-term consequences. So just be cautious of that. Yes, so I think we've had a really rich discussion and I'm really glad to thank to Nelson Mandela University and the Court of Elizabeth. I want to thank all of you for really participating. Uh, I'm chairing and representing the Academy for tonight, so obviously I can't say much, but let me just say one thing. I think the issue of evidence, uh, you know, I come from both a natural science and a social science background, uh, so I do want to say something about that. I think on the, I, I really do believe that evidence matters. When I get on a plane, I don't want a debate, you know, on, on evidence for thermodynamics and, and so on. When I have cardiac th thoracic surgery, I don't want to debate, you know, on, on all of those things. When I work with children every day, like this morning in primary schools, there are certain reading methods that work and others that don't. So I don't think we must become too skeptical about evidence because then I think you are feeding into some of these right-wing movements, as in the United States right now, that even question something as devastating as climate science. So I think we must continue to have a healthy respect for evidence and for scientifically-led evidence. That said, I think we also have to understand that evidence is socially constructed, that evidence is, as you've seen, uh, capable of being abused. Uh, uh, by pharmaceutical industries, by other people who want to make a profit out of, uh, uh, you know, the synthetic manufacturing of drugs. Just keep those two things in balance, because if you're simply going to sort of poo-poo evidence as a whole and have a free-for-all, we'll have a very dangerous society, uh, as you're seeing right now uh, under President Trump. Anyway, to leave on a slightly, <laughs> to leave you on a slightly lighter note and with respect to my friend, the chemist, who, like all the speakers, was absolutely amazing. I just had this joke, sorry about the joke, you know. Um, the chemistry teacher asked the pupil, let's just give the pupil a random name, uh, Malusi. So the, the, the chemistry teacher says to Malusi, did you know that uh, protons have mass? Malusi said, <laughs> I didn't even know they were Catholic. Anyway, thank you very much for being here. Be blessed and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.